Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9. All right, we're going to come to verse 18. Genesis chapter 9, and then uh, we're now at verse 18. Uh, just in case, I'll cover verse 17, in case if I didn't really cover that last chance to study. And remember, this is literally verse by verse, word for word, that I'm going to be explaining. So when I'm explaining every word in the verse, I want you to automatically explain it in your mind. I want you to fully understand every word that I'm explaining. So if something sounds repetitive or something that should be obvious or self-explanatory, I want it to be that way in your mind. You might say, why? Because a lot of people keep saying the Bible's too hard to understand. So that's the purpose of this verse-by-verse, -verse, word for word Bible study. Okay, so I want you all to remember that. That way, uh, when I explain every word in that verse, um, you can automatically do it yourself rather than falling asleep and say, oh, I already know what the next one is. Not really. No, you don't. So that's why um, I want you to see if my explanation matches with how you're explaining it in your mind when you look at the verse. Okay? All right, let's go to verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Okay, so Noah's sons, you'll notice his three sons here, we're going to lay it out, that went forth of the ark. So they went forth, they went out to go throughout all the world. They went out of the ark, and their names were Shem and Ham and Japheth, as you might see on the whiteboard right here. And then the Bible says Ham is the father of Canaan. So then Ham has a son, his name is Canaan. Now that wording is going to be important later on and we'll cover him later. But his name will, uh, but that wording, not just the name, but the wording of it is going to be important. The Bible says Ham is the father. Okay, let's keep reading down. These are the three sons of Noah. Okay, so that's self-explanatory. Those three names are Noah's sons. And of them was the whole earth overspread. So it's through of these three sons that the whole earth, it was spread out all over. So all the inhabitants were able to spread out throughout the whole earth. Now, Dr. Uckman writes over here, uh, which is a pretty good point. Let's see right here. Uh, in his footnote 6 on chapter 9, verse 19, uh, this statement is scientifically, historically, and ethnologically correct, and the National Geographic is wrong as usual. The descendants of Noah had 3,000 years to get from Mount Ararat to South, Central, and North America before 1492. You know, that's when Columbus discovered the Americas. Now, if you recall in your evolution studies, or in secular education or the National Geographic, they would try to criticize your Bible in, well, how can the whole earth spread out in such a short amount of time with just through three suns? That's why you need millions of years. Although that, but no, that's not really true. Dr. Upman points out some good arguments here. 3,000 years, you, can, uh, you have that much time. And not only that, he adds here, that is at a snail's pace of a hundred yards a day, they could have traveled 61,307 miles before AD 1000. That's pretty interesting. The Shemites travel west to east, wrong direction, which I don't have to explain why. You already learned that in your Genesis studies. Across the Bering Strait and wind up as the American Indian so that the European Japheth can dwell in their tents, which he does. History and fal infallibly corroborates the material found in a King James 1611 Bible with complete disregard for the researches and opinions of any 500,000 highly educated idiots who ever lost their minds trying to correct God. Yeah, amen. So it's pretty simple. The Bible shows that the whole earth is easily spread about. Even if you go about 100 yards a day, you can cover the whole world. But not only that, remember this. Remember that when the waters uh, were dried up, that basically the inhabitants, they can be able to walk through dry land. And then that's the reason why the inhabitants, they were able to uh, carry onward 
and they were able to travel if we were to go from uh, Asia and then to Japan and then to North America down to South America. There doesn't have to be that much water blocking. There could have been more land mass that time and then the water could have gone higher. I mean, isn't that what you learn in liberal educated schools that, you know, water elevation is going higher because of global warming and the glaciers are freezing and etc. So, I mean, they should even know that. <laughs> but anyways, if we were to come down to Genesis chapter 9, the point is, is that it is very, very possible, and not just possible, it is scientifically accurate and likely that they could spread about through the whole earth. There's not like large bodies of ocean blocking it. Now, it's not a joke, but uh, it's actually scientifically, quote-unquote, scientifically serious. Because of this dilemma about how people can spread about, and the National Geographic refuses the Genesis account, they think the more logical option is that your ancestors, who were still monkeys at that time, that they were rowing boats, they were rowing on a plank, sailing across the ocean, from, let's, from Africa all the way to America. I kid you not. That's what you would resort to if you reject the Genesis account. Well, that don't make sense. Well, what makes more sense? A stupid monkey carrying a clan with him and uh, rowing across the ocean? <laughs> I don't know what's more stupid to me. I don't know what's more quote-unquote scientific to me. All right, so they're ridiculous itself. Now, there's another thing to keep in mind in verse 19. The whole earth was overspread through these three inhabitants. Uh, excuse me, through these three individuals. And then the inhabitants were able to spread about through all the lands. They were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, this is basic sociology 101, but actually the scientists keep revising it. And the reason why they keep revising it is because of cultural sensitivity or something that seems racially incorrect or etc. So then they want, what they want to do in liberal educated schools is make the lines very bleak concerning about uh, distinctions with ethnicities and races and etc. The reason why they want to do that is because they want to make it more one world. Now remember, that's the Antichrist goal, is to make sure that there's no distinction so that all nations can unite and become one world. Now, you know what's also funny? The liberals have a fire back to that, okay? For them to argue that we want to be so one world and so uh, one-minded that the distinctions are blurred, now people have gotten super hyper-culturally sensitive that they're saying, no, then you're denying my race. You're denying the importance of my nationality. So what was back then where uh, black people were distinguished from white people and then they're saying, no, 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 I don't see a difference. Now the black people got offended. No, then you're denying my ethnicity, then my culture. And that's the same thing with the Asians and Native Americans and etc. So as you see what they do when mankind tries to do something that's mentally abnormal, that's distinct, that is uh, anti-biblical, they try to go against the Bible. You even, you'll still offend people. You'll still hurt people. And besides, that is a, uh, I actually agree with that pointer. You're denying my cultural, my ethnic distinction, which is valuable. That is actually very important. We all have our uh, nationalities, our cultures, or where we come from. It is very important about our, uh, the groups of people that the Lord has uh, spread out throughout all the lands and then for thousands of years what we grew up into. It is very important. If you don't believe that there's a distinction, then uh, what Dr. Rutten would say, then you're, not, you're mentally abnormal. There is distinction within our church too. Every one of us has our own personality, culture, and background. Right. But in spite of that, you know how we are able to unite as one as Bible believers? Not with this New World Order concept. How we're able to unite as one is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So then uh, there's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It doesn't matter Jew, Gentile, bond or free. We're all one because of Jesus Christ. In that sense, we're one. But we know that we're definitely very, we're a very unique church. Well, are we? We're one church that consists of many different personalities, cultures, nationalities. That's what makes us unique. For us to pretend and to deny our uniqueness, it ruins our oneness as a church, our uniqueness as a church. 
Now, did I make any sense right here? I mean, we got a bunch of uh, preachers, evangelists, and people who come over here. They haven't been, they rarely been to churches like ours. Not even big churches are like ours. I mean, we're very, very unique as a church. So, prize what the Lord has given to you. And don't take shame and deny your history or how the Lord spread about throughout all the earth. Okay? The uh, mindset of the world is always distorted and messed up. Now, understanding that we have these uh, three individuals, like I said, Sociology 101 uh, used to teach this, but now they're changing. Surprisingly, though, at, uh, during my time when I went to college, they still taught this. So I was surprised. I was like, wow, this should be illegal in the college classroom setting. Maybe if I complained to the faculty, I would have gotten a reward for that one, you know? So, uh, but uh, this is what I read in my Sociology 101 book, which was surprising to me. So Sociology 101, they would teach that Shem, that's where the Asian people came from. And then in Ham... Now, back then they would say African-American, so not to offend, but now that's an offensive term. They want to go back to black. So I don't know which word to use anymore, but right now they say black. That's what I learned in my liberal college classes. So they said to actually say black, so I'll say that, okay? All right, so then black people, Asian people, you know, so that I don't offend. They want me to write down people in my report, so I'll put people here, people here, okay? All right, and then right here, uh, people. So white people. People is offensive now. Yeah, people is offensive now, too. All right. What should we put over here? You know? <laughs> this is why I hate this, uh, I hate this sensitivity mindset where our world is falling, all right? I told you before, the LGBTQ club, I mean, they were so uh, sensitive about how they're being stereotyped that they're even accusing each other, you know, that uh, the way you termed it to me, because there are too many alphabets right there, LGBTQ, so then I guess the Q would accuse the L, and then the B would accuse the Q. I mean, it's really funny. I mean, I try to hold back my laughter. I was like, wow, this is the kind of mindset you end up with. Yeah, yeah. My goodness, let's keep it simple, all right? The Lord, we all know where we all come from. That's how the Lord spread us about. But hey, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ because we got the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now it's that simple. Okay, my goodness, everyone being sensitive, you know? All right, so this is uh, Sociology 101. That's what they said. That's where three groups all spread about. Now, because this is basic Sociology 101, we see that this is scientific. And then another question we have in mind then is, then how do we get the distinctions, right? How do we get the distinctions? Uh, because, let's be honest, we're all physically distinct. So, how are you going to get that when they all come from Noah? Now, this is not difficult to believe in, and I don't know why scientists have a hard time with the Genesis account, because, I mean, this is uh, what they believe in evolution. So, what they believe in evolution... And Bible believers, we can believe in minute changes, all right? So that's what they call microevolution. But we don't believe in macroevolution. In other words, that a monkey is going to suddenly jump into a human one day, all right? Uh, or gradually, if that sounds scientifically inaccurate. For some of you sensitive atheists over there, all right? Oh my goodness, you know what I'm talking about. Everyone's sensitive nowadays. But anyway, so then it's not like that a monkey will transform to a human. But monkey, uh, but a, uh, a dog can turn into a different dog species, a cat to a different uh, cat species, etc. So we believe in that. So then these people here, uh, how are they, uh, how did we get these distinctions? Well, I mean, the evolutionists teach that through the climate and the environment, that's how we got all our distinctions. Because of the cold weather, and then because of the hot weather, and etc., uh, the skin color changes. People will be taller, people will be uh, shorter. I said shoulder, shorter, etc. So that's what happens through environmental changes, which is normal. So then, uh, why don't you believe that with Noah's three children? It's that simple. I don't know why that's so scientifically hard to believe. Now, if uh, talking about the atmosphere and the shortness of time, this may have been possible. Remember, the flood is a worldwide cataclysmic event, okay? 
So then the earth, because it had to receive such kind of cataclysmic event, the way that the earth was going, uh, basically in its motion or it's in its course or orbit, however way you want to word it, it was out of it. It was out of course. It wasn't going at a normal pace, so to speak, or a normal course. So then it may have been that the sun may have moved toward a different direction or the atmosphere was different and there's no doubt about that because how are you going to get that worldwide flood? God had to change the atmosphere, the sun, the climate and everything. Not only that, remember he opened up the windows of heaven. Yeah. So then he had to send that heavy uh, rainfall. That's where all the water came from. So there's no doubt that the earth atmosphere was totally different during the flood. So then when the flood was receding and the atmosphere was recovering, it is very, very possible that the three sons over here, and even including Noah and his wife, they went through uh, physical changes. Because remember, phys uh, biological changes are affected by the atmosphere, the environmental conditions. So uh, let me uh, repeat over here. So basically, remember this is that the atmosphere is affected, okay? I'll put it all the way up to here. The atmosphere, there is no doubt about it. The atmosphere and the earth is certainly and, def and definitely affected by the flood. It changed, okay? And when I mean change, it had to be dramatic. Huge change, dramatically changed. Because it went through a, such a huge, dramatic change, biological changes can be much faster. Right, right. So then, Noah, his wife, and his three sons could have went through biological changes really fast. So that's the answer to where we get all our different uh, nationality, ethnicities, and races. So, it's simple to think that way, and it's very scientific and logical too. I mean, even evolutionists teach that, right? Because of environmental conditions. That's the reason why we all went through biological changes. So, I don't know why they have a hard time believing that one. Uh, there's another uh, explanation which I don't really go for, but uh, this is uh, obviously scientific. What's obviously scientific is that if uh, Noah married a different nationality f uh, from his wife, then you can get your different, uh, then you get your three sons with all their different nationalities. Because remember, how we come up with different ethnicities and nationalities is because of a lot of intermarrying going on. There was no such thing as uh, no intermarriage and everyone was clean. No, there was too much intermarriage that I taught you even in world history class during the ancient times. So there was so much mingling and that's the reason why we came up with our own cultures and our own nations later on in history. So that may have been possible too. But uh, from what I see, within a short span of time, uh, then you have to ask the question where Noah got his wife. Uh, people mention that uh, Ham could have gotten a different wife too. So that may have been possible. But then I don't see where, uh, it's kind of hard for me to see where Noah and then the family get their different nationality children from. Because everyone came from Adam's line. So unless Adam's children went through biological changes, maybe because of sons of God intermingling, that could be possible, but it's just too much. Uh, remember, uh, but this might sound very scientifically plausible. Remember Genesis 6? Everyone was marrying like cats and dogs. And I mean like really bad. Remember that? They were intermingling way too much. And some things that were pretty disturbing too. If you take that into account, it's very, very possible the offspring and people who were born from that, there were drastic biological changes. So if we put it that way, that can be very scientifically plausible then. It's because of the so much intermingling during Genesis 6. But uh, if I'm going to be something that would be, I guess, more normal, so to speak, so-called normal, right? This would probably be the most uh, uh, this would probably be the most convincing explanation. It's because of that flood. If we believe a huge dramatic change happened to the Earth's course and the environment, then obviously there would be huge dramatic biological changes as well. All right, but anyways, Genesis chapter nine. Genesis chapter nine. And Noah began to be a husbandman, 
You might say, what does that mean? That he became a husband, he got married? No, it means that, uh, keep reading, and he planted a vineyard. That's what it means. So Noah, he started to, take, uh, to become a husbandman, meaning uh, those who took care or who tended the vineyard, okay? And he planted a vineyard. So he planted a vineyard. So Noah, he decided to plant a vineyard. All right? All right, I'm going to make, grow some grapes. So he planted a vineyard. So then he planted a vineyard, and then he was like, okay, so now that I planted a vineyard, what am I going to do with it? Now remember, at the Garden of Eden, what kind of fruit was it that I pointed out is very, very likely? It's the, uh, it's the grape, right? It's the grape. So it's the grapefruit. So, knowing that it's the grapefruit, notice how Noah is matching up with Adam all over again. There's a lot of uh, similarity with Noah and Adam. If there's a grapefruit involved, then the first thing is that you're going to have in your mind is something sinful might happen, right? Something sinful. Something sinful might happen. And secondly, for some of you who never thought of this, if you recall about sinning with the grapefruit, there was something sexual too, right? Remember that at Genesis chapter 3, which was pretty wild? When it comes to the grapefruit, there's something weird. It's always, the first thing in your mind is something sinful might happen. Now, not all the time, obviously, but quite often it is. Even Jesus' blood, that's supposed to symbolize his blood, you got to realize the blood is for the remission of sins. See, so something sinful is involved. That's the first thing when you see grapefruit. And God, for, uh, God forbade some people, some specific Jews, to actually eat grape juice because there's something sinful about it. The second thing in your mind when you hear about grape is something sexual is going to happen. It's pretty weird. It's always these two things. Now, I wonder if that's going to happen. Genesis 3, we see, we saw that it is very, very possible it did happen. But Genesis 9 is way more plain. It points out that it really did happen, all right? And I'm going to point it out at Genesis 9. So, uh, let's see what Noah did, all right? Verse 21, and he drank of the wine and was drunken. So then, uh, he drank of the wine. So obviously, he planted a vineyard so that he can uh, drink grape juice, but the Bible shows it's wine, so it's, uh, and he was drunken. So that's pretty obvious. This ain't just normal grape juice. This is fermented. So because this is fermented, this is, uh, this is alcoholic, and he got drunk on it. And he was uncovered within his tent. Now notice that wording, okay? So he's not covered within his tent. Uh, I'll come to that a little bit later. But... Verse 21, some people might wonder, why would Noah uh, plant a vineyard and get drunk? The thing is this, is that it may not have been intentional. Okay, it may not have been intentional. Because remember, the environment went through changes. So Noah, it's possible that he may have thought, because there were people who ate uh, all sorts of fruits uh, during about thousand years or a couple thousand years, I'm sure there were people who took the fruit because everyone was, remember, not eating meat. They were eating fruits and vegetables during Adam and Noah's timeline before the flood. So now all they had was fruits and vegetables. I'm pretty sure that uh, they drank of the juice too from the fruit. I mean, you got thousands of years, you know, during that time. So I'm sure, so probably Noah, he just thought it as normal, you know, uh, man, I miss those uh, grapes. So I can't wait. When I get out of the ark, I'm going to eat those grapes. And then when he did that, uh, because the environmental changes and the climate was not like what it used to be, yeah, it may, he may have left it out a little bit longer and then it may have been fermented or he may have dabbled it with, the, with it a little bit more and then became something alcoholic. And then he got drunk. So that may have been possible. What may have been possible is that when he was drinking that grape juice and he realized this is different, but hey, and then he just got hooked on it, and then he just, because that's what alcohol does, and then just kept drinking, drinking, and then he got drunk. So that may have been possible. That may have been possible. 
So he was uncovered within his tent. So inside his tent, he's uncovered, whatever that means, okay? So we'll just say that he got uncovered here. Now let's cover one by one what went on with Noah. Keep reading down, and Ham, the father of Canaan, now notice the King James Bible words that again for some strange reason. It just doesn't say Ham. It keeps saying Ham, the father of Canaan, because it's trying to point out something specific here. So remember, uh, one of Ham's children is uh, Canaan, all right? So that's self-explanatory. Saw the nakedness of his father. Okay, so he saw his father naked. Now notice the wording here. It doesn't say that he saw his father drunk. He saw his father sleeping. It says, saw the nakedness of his father. So it's showing something going on over here then. Keep reading. And told his two brethren without. So then he told his two brothers after that. After he saw his father being naked, then he started to tell his two brothers. Without. So outside of the tent, obviously. Outside of what happened when Ham saw Verse 23, and Shem and Japheth took a garment. So the two other sons of Noah, Shem and Japheth, they took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. So then they put a garment on their shoulders and they, were going, they went backward so that they don't see their father's nakedness. They covered their father's nakedness and then what? They uh, carried him... Uh, they covered him, or they may have taken him to a different place too. And their faces were backward. So, notice the scripture, how it's worded. I mean, uh, it keeps repeating this, it keeps wording it. So, their faces, uh, the Bible was very specific. These two sons made sure that their face were backward. They didn't see their father's nakedness. And they saw not their father's nakedness. So the, the scripture made it very clear. They didn't see their father naked. Verse 24, And Noah awoke from his wine. So, obvious, so Noah got sober. He woke up uh, after drinking wine, after having a drunken uh, stupor or sleep. He woke from it and knew what his younger son uh, excuse me, and knew what his younger son ha had what? Done unto him. You see that wording there? Not just that his younger son saw him, but what he specifically did to him, no one knew. Now, notice that I didn't even give you a conclusion, but just stressing so much on the wording here, literally word for word, and the scripture, your mind's already made up its conclusion. So it should be pretty obvious then what happened then. You don't need... Uh, uh, you don't need a PhD to know what's going on. You don't need to uh, be an expert in Hebrew and Greek to know what the real word's going on. No, you just concentrate on the word and how the Bible emphasized and repeated itself and it's pretty obvious when it, what happened, when it, what pops into your mind. Verse 25, and he said, so Noah said, blessed be, no, cursed be Canaan. So look at this one. Noah, I mean, think about this. Let's say what happened was Ham, at verse 22, all he did was see his father naked. That's it. All right? All I saw was my dad naked. And all of a sudden, the dad said, Curse you! And then you would go, It ain't my fault! You got drunk, you got naked! So then, obviously, this ain't just uh, innocent sightseeing. This was something deep. Well, what do we know from Scripture? If you know from Scripture, compare Scripture with Scripture... And if you remember what happened in Genesis 3, what I pointed out, when grapefruit is mentioned, the first thing that pops out is something sinful happened. And then the second thing is something sexual. So that's what happened. But let's look at Scripture with Scripture. First is uncovered. Go to Leviticus 18. Now look, look at Genesis 9, the wording. It says here... Uh, Verse 21, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was what? Uncovered within his tent. You see that? Verse 23, Shem, Japheth made sure to cover the nakedness of their father. You see that? Now think about this. Shem and Japheth, they could have just left their dad alone, right? But uh, they covered. Why? Because uncovered and covered is something which is pretty obvious in Scripture. Look at Leviticus 18. Scripture with Scripture. 
Scripture with Scripture has the answer. Now notice what God said right here at verse 7. Verse 7. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. You see that? She is thy mother, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. Now if you keep reading down, that's pretty obvious. God was uh, condemning incest over here. Why? Because during that time there was so much uh, wrong things going on in the land of Canaan that they were intermingling. They were intermingling with God knows what, all kinds of sinful stuff in Canaan. Wait a minute, if God warned them about the, sin, the sexual sins that Canaan was do doing, where did Canaan learn that from? Mmm, see that there? See that there? Scripture with Scripture. So it becomes pretty obvious then. It becomes very obvious. Uh, here's another one. Let's go to Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Let's go to the book of Habakkuk. And we're going to look at chapter 2, Habakkuk chapter 2. Notice why the Bible condemns a drinking wine. Because there's something specific going on. The intention, and this is pretty obvious today. Why do sometimes some criminals uh, who, and then some rape victims suffer through this encounter? They like to get the victim drunk. Not only that, there are people who go to parties... They get drunk for a reason. All right? It should be pretty obvious then. should be pretty obvious. That's the reason why God condemns uh, alcohol because one of the consequences of sin is fornication that comes out or sexual sins that come out. All right, let's look at Habakkuk chapter 2. Look at verse 5, verse 5. Yea, also because he transgresseth by wine. All right, that's what Noah did, right? He sinned by getting drunk. Look at what happens here. He is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. And then, uh, oh, uh, it wasn't, it's this verse, but let me keep reading. Okay, yeah, right here, verse 15, verse 15. Here we go. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him. Okay, why? Why getting him drunk? And mayest, makest him drunken also. Look at this, that thou mayest what? Look on their naked. That's obvious. There's no doubt. It's sexual. That's no doubt sexual. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee. Now that should be plain, verse 16. That is definitely sexual, the wording there. So there's no doubt. I mean, when you look at just two passages, I don't even have to show you more, but these two passages alone show it's very definite. Ham did something wicked with his father, and then from the wine, it's something sexual. No wonder Noah, I mean, don't you think that's the reason why he cursed Ham? That would explain a lot. He was really ticked off, man. That's the reason why, verse 23, Shem and Japheth, you know, they want to cover their father's nakedness because they were ashamed, they were scared. Now, this is pretty disturbing to me at verse 22. I don't know why Ham would tell it to his two brothers. That is something um, very distorted, disturbing. So then why in the world would Ham tell his two brothers about it and then the brothers would get so disturbed that they would cover their father's nakedness? So it might be two possibilities. It might be one, Ham didn't say the whole story. Okay, He may have said, yeah, dad's drunk in his tent. Maybe that's what would have happened. But, uh, or, number two, number two, it could be that Ham was drunk too. Sometimes when uh, you get curious, right, you know, why is dad drunk, naked, and there's a bottle of grape juice, uh, there's a, a glass of grape juice there. I wonder what's going on. And then he got drunk himself too. That could have been very possible. Or three, which is very sad, but this does happen. What happens with uh, people sh shamefully, and they're unashamed to do this, is that they would shamelessly talk about how they 
hitched up with some pretty girl and then because they, they were so smooth and they were so skillful and they got this girl drunk that they were able to sleep with her and they like to boast about that. You know what men learn from history is that what? Men never learn from history. You don't, you're no different from Genesis 9. Human nature has always been the same. All right, so those are three possibilities what would have happened. All right, verse 25. All right, I'm going to read verse 25 all the way to 27, okay? So I'm going to read it all at once. And he said, so Noah said, Cursed be Canaan. So Noah pronounced a curse on Ham's seed, and that's his child, Canaan, right here, okay? So Canaan has been cursed. And it's interesting when you read Leviticus 18, Canaan was following what his dad did. A servant of servants shall he, uh, he be unto his brethren. So Canaan becomes servant of servants. So then he has to live in servitude uh, to his brothers, which is uh, Shem and Japheth. Verse 26, And he said, Noah speaks again, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. So Shem, notice that he becomes blessed, but notice it says the Lord God of Shem. So, Noah's blessing is concentrated on Shem, particularly for his God. For his God, how he worships God. And Canaan shall be his servant. So, Canaan, so Ham's seed, becomes servant to Shem. Uh, to explain this one on Shem a little bit more, because I want to concentrate on Ham's curse uh, more, so I'm going to quickly go through uh, Shem and Japheth quickly. So Shem, the reason why that he's been blessed is more particularly, notice it's towards something religious or spiritual. That's where he gets his blessing. Now there's no doubt that Shem receives that blessing because from Shem's line comes the Jews, okay? Jews are Semite. That's why when we say anti-Semitism, or if you're an anti-Semite, concerning about being anti-Jew, it's because of Shem, all right? Now, uh, Jews come from Shem, and obviously, because they worship the one true God, that's why they receive that blessing. It's from Shem's blessing. Not only that, Shem, they're very focused on religion. They're very focused on a religious aspect here, deep into spiritualism, and uh, deep into God. The Native Americans, uh, I, I say this, uh, I'm not, uh, so I want to be careful when I say this. So I just want to say it's possible, all right? Because I want to be open to all avenues. It may have been possible the Native Americans could have got saved because a lot of what their pagan stories talk about, about the one great spirit and all that, they're trying to go back, they're trying to seek after the one true God. That's the thing. Now obviously it's been distorted and corrupted throughout time because Satan has always done that. But the point here is that uh, Shem... He's received the blessing about something about the one God, right? The one true God. The Lord God of Shem. You see that? So that was his advantage. But notice it was a disadvantage too. You notice that. It was a disadvantage where the devil used it. But I'm going to explain that. When I come across explaining the curse of uh, Ham's seed and then the blessing of Shem and Japheth, I'm going to explain the pros and cons of that. Okay? So that way it will be more enlightening. But let me just briefly explain quickly. And I can explain. All right. Uh, verse 27, God shall enlarge Japheth. Okay, so God's going to make Japheth large. All right, where's your proof? Look at Brother Max. He's so large. Okay, so God shall enlarge Japheth. Now, obviously, that's not what it means, okay? What it means is that, look at the next part, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. So meaning that Japheth's lineage is going to spread out. It's going to be so large that it's going to dominate and spread out that he's even going to live, dwell where Shem lives, okay, in his tents. So that becomes pretty obvious. Why? Well, look what came out of Japheth. Look at history. History is so undeniable about that. One is Alexander the Great, right? I mean, he was swallowing up empires. Look at Rome. They, their empire was even more huge after that because they uh, took over Alexander the Great. Uh, look, at an, uh, look at the infamous uh, colonization that you hear about in secular schools today. I mean, uh, England and America, they were colonizing throughout all the lands that they were even dwelling 
in uh, Asiatic countries as well. So they were dominating, they were spreading out. So obviously the colonization. So that was Japheth's blessing that he received. But obviously, just like Shem who received his blessing, uh, there was a bad thing that came out as well. Oh, the, Alexander the Great? What am I doing? I'm still asleep. Okay. <laughs> Alexander the Great. Some of you were sleeping too. You didn't point that out. But anyway. <laughs> Alright, so the, obviously there was something bad about it too. Because uh, I don't need to tell you. You've already learned that from all your secular schools. So why do I need to tell you? All right. So the thing is this. Um, Japheth received that blessing from the Lord to spread out throughout all the land. And Canaan shall be his servant. So just like Canaan became Shem's servant, Canaan is also going to be Japheth's servant as well. So that was the curse that uh, Ham received is servitude or service to both Shem and Japheth. Now let's cover the controversy here, all right? Yeah, we all love controversies, don't we? All right. So this is obviously ex an extremely sensitive subject here. So then, uh, you'll notice that then it would point out right here, then you're condoning black slavery, right? You're condoning the oppression of black people. So you're saying that God ordained it this way. So let me explain it one by one, all right? First of all, this. No, I, it doesn't justify, like I pointed out in world history classes, God condoned people kidnapping other uh, people and then selling them off as slaves, okay? So God, he condemned that throughout the Bible. So no, it doesn't mean that I'm condoning black slavery or etc. But the thing is this, is that if you look at the passage over here, what did I point out? In the curse that Ham received at verse 25, I indicated pros and cons. Verse 27 and 26 about Shem and Japheth, pros and cons. So what does that mean? What that means is this, is that when God gave a curse and a blessing, people can use it wrongly. All right, that's something people don't understand. What do I mean by that? All right, so let me explain over here, okay? You can use it well or you can use it wrongly. That's a pointer here. Uh, let me point out, let me write this one down. That way it can all match up with Noah's drunkenness. So remember this. So Shem got the blessing, all right? That blessed be the Lord God of Shem. So that doesn't mean, oh, you know, all Asians are good people then. All Asians are good people. And the black people, they're all bad people from Ham. That's not what it means right here. People are people. It doesn't matter about culture or race. People are people. Everyone has a free choice and a decision. When God gives a certain group, there's no doubt about that, but I'll show you in later verses. God sometimes, whether we like it or not, picks individuals or groups to give blessings and curses. But then the people, how they take in that blessing and, they, and their curse, they can use it well or they can use it for evil. Right. That doesn't mean that just because Ham got cursed that everyone's bad in Ham and Shem got blessed that everyone's good in Shem. And the same thing with Japheth. That's not what it means. See that? People, uh, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. People are people. Everyone has free choice. Everyone sins. So the pointer out here is that, yes, Shem received the blessing here. But notice that they used it wrongly as well. Like I point out, the Native Americans, right? Like I point out, the Eastern religions, deep into that spiritism. That's actually, a lot of it is demon possession. A lot of it is demon possession right here. All right, let's cover Japheth's blessing, okay? So Japheth, he got the blessing too, but he used it wrongly as well. Why? Because you got this one going on, and then he has a bad history of that one. So you hear that touted in public school, so I don't need to tell you. But also, I mean, it is true, which is very sad, there were thousands, maybe millions, of different nationalities, especially the Native Americans, uh, when there were, when uh, Japheth's line colonized, when they colonized. So then because of that, that doesn't mean that, oh, the white people, they were good. Good job on what you did in the colonization. No, that's not what it means. They used it for evil. Why? Because when God gives a blessing and advantage or a gift to people, people tend to use it wrongly, unfortunately. You want an example? God gave you eyes to see. And you use it, real, you, that advantage and blessing God has given to you, you used it for evil. Feeling a little bit under conviction here? 
So the pointer out is this, is that it doesn't mean that this guy's good, this guy's bad. The pointer out right here is that God blesses, God curses, and then the people who take it, they can use it for evil or they can use it for good. Now, let me point out Ham's line here, okay? So Ham, he received that curse, but like I pointed out right here, you can use it for evil or you can use it for good. The evil is this, is that the evil, how Ham took that curse is, if you study history, which is infamous and sad, and there are black political activists who even talk about this, black pastors, is that Africans were selling off their own people. They were selling off their own people, kidnapping their own people, and selling them off to the whites or to the other nations. And by the way, this wasn't during just the Spanish colonization or the American or the Atlantic slave trade. This was going on centuries before. Because remember, I told you, Africa was a powerful, rich empire before the Spanish Catholic Empire became powerful. But how did Africa become so rich and powerful? Slave trade, too. That's why they, they were very powerful. But then the Spanish took that over, and that's why they became powerful. People get rich off of slavery. That's the bottom line. That's why Satan, he loves slavery at Revelation 17, 18. Babylon Empire became rich from what? Slavery, the souls of men. So that's the bad thing Ham used it. But, like, like I point out, you can use it for good too. Well, how can you use God's curse for good? Well, you certainly can use it for good. Didn't the Bible says all things work together for good? Bad and good in life. How did Ham use that? They became, uh, whether you believe it or not, but this is uh, what I believe in soul winning experience, they are the most soft-hearted to the gospel. Now, they can be sometimes very anti, but, you know, when you witness around these parts, we know who is the first people who would reject the gospel. Yeah. White. <laughs> it's white, okay? Rich white people especially, all right? Yeah. So when we've, do, when we've done witnessing, we've seen that the white people, they're very... Uh, uh, spiteful toward the gospel. And by the way, these are su supposed to be white people who are very good liberals too, who pretend they love all minorities, okay? But anyway, returning back to the main point here. But then the black people, they're the ones that are the most easy or soft-hearted to the gospel, I noticed. Uh, when we started out our church, we rented from a black church building, actually. So that's what we used it from. Uh, the black people, why is that? Uh, even during the slavery, that infamous Atlantic slave trade, when they were uh, carried on to ships toward the South and the North and to the Americas, a lot of them, you know why they carried on a uh, Baptist heritage, heritage today? Didn't you notice that? There's a lot of black churches that would carry on the Baptist heritage. You know why? Because all the way back then, when they were, they were Baptists over there, and they were soft-hearted to the gospel. Even during the slavery, you know what they were doing? They were singing uh, spiritual songs as well, even during slavery. Uh, they would always have church. They would always have gatherings together. They were very soft-hearted to the gospel. So you notice, uh, as a matter of fact, I took... Uh, well, that's the name of the course, so who cares if it's offensive. Okay, the name of the course in Berkeley, they called it this, okay? African-American literature, all right? Oh, did I offend somebody? All right, so African-American literature, I studied in Berkeley, and they took all these uh, people who ended up as slaves, actually. But they wrote a lot of poems, and I was shocked. I, I couldn't believe what I was reading, but these people, when they were writing their poems, they said this, okay? I thank God that I was actually sold off as a slave. Why? So that I can hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved from the paganism back there. And I was like, dude, man, I don't know if any Christian has that kind of heart, right heart and mentality and attitude. Now, you talk about somebody who's willing to go through the, uh, the basest uh, places in life and thank the Lord for it. Uh, the first person who got saved in your Bible, Christian salvation, you know who it was? Was Ethiopian what? Eunuch, servant of servants. That was the first record of New Testament Christian salvation. Why is he prone to do that? Because that's what God wants, a repentant heart, a sermon of servants. I'm no good. I'm nothing. I know what I am. I'm the basis, the low, and I receive Christ for my salvation. So that's what happened, the problem with the Jewish people now. So now let's cover some of the areas. Let's go to uh, Isaiah, uh, 
Zechariah. We're going to go to Zechariah 3. And then I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians 2. Zechariah 3 and 1 Thessalonians 2. Zechariah 3 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, uh, let me say this quickly because I don't have much time, all right? So let me try to go through this quickly. The reason why I'm expounding this is because it's obviously a very sensitive subject. So I'm trying to explain as best as I can and thoroughly. And, okay, so uh, bottom line is this. Okay, so then notice that Ham got the curse. But see, that's the problem is that uh, all you guys are focusing is Ham getting a curse. So then automatically we should uh, detour on that one. No, you don't detour on that. You know why? Because it's not just Ham. I guess you're a racist then for just think thinking that, all right, that Ham seeds only curse. You got to realize this is that everybody, didn't you know this is not just Ham. Do you know how many curses are in your Bible when God picked different nations for cursing? That's inevitable in Scripture. So because that's inevitable in Scripture, we can't just detour Ham's curse and pretend it don't exist. Look, God put a curse not just on Ham, then I guess you're racist for thinking that then. God put a curse upon all sorts of nations. Do you know that when you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, and a lot of other passages, do you know how much of that is filled with cursing for specific nations? Groups of people? Why would God do that? I think he just wants you to learn from your history. That you don't follow from what your previous ancestors did. That's the bottom line. Why would, if God never put a curse, then what? God can't punish anybody for the wrongdoing they've done. So he put curses not just on him, he put curses on all sorts of nations. And by the way, guess what? You're going to come to find out that every single person received a curse. No exception. So I'm going to show you one by one, all right? First of all, let's look at uh, Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. And then uh, we're going to read verse... Oh, so it's not Zechariah chapter 3. Uh, it was probably Zephaniah, excuse me. So let's look at Zephaniah 3. All right. If it's not that one, then... Uh, I'll just uh, tell you to go home and do your research. <laughs> uh, yes, Zephaniah 3, not Zechariah. Zephaniah 3, verse 8, verse 8, uh, verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations. Now, did you see that? You see that? God puts nationalities here. He's going to gather them. Why? that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. Now that's quite a curse. God puts a curse on these nations that, no, it's no such thing as multicultural, multilingual. No, these nationalities, I'm going to gather, my curse is I'm going to gather you all together so I can wipe you all out. Yeah. And that's fulfilled in the tribulation. Right. Nothing, uh, you might say, sing God bless America, be all patriotic, and don't get me wrong, look, I respect my country and thank God for my beginnings. But guess what? In Scripture, what you're going to find out is all nationalities receive a curse. And they become nothing at the end. Now, this is purely racist. Look at verse 9. For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord. That's racist right there. God's like, no, I'm not going to have multi-languages right here. And it's not Korean either. It's what? It's Jewish. Verse 9, it's Jewish. That's a pure language. See, you talk about picking and choosing. You talk about racism here. But that's not what it is. People automatically, when God chooses, it doesn't matter a nation or an individual. When God uh, curses or blesses a nation or an individual, automatically, the mind of the person criticizing God is unfairness, playing victim, or racism, or favoritism. No, it's called God can do whatever He wants. Simple. That's what it is. God can do whatever He wants. Why? Because He's God. So if He chooses a group or a person to curse, or a group or a person to bless, He does it for good reason, and He's God. 
But look at the Jews. Just because the Jews get blessed, it don't mean, oh, Jews, good guy, everyone, bad guy. No, look at the nation of Israel. They're actually very heinous and evil today. So look at 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2. Look at verse 14 through 16. 14 through 16. Notice the last part. I have to wrap this up quickly. Last part of verse 14. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Okay, what happened to these Jews? The last part of verse 16 says, For the wrath is come upon them to the what? Uttermost. uttermost. To the uttermost. So God curses them too. Now, don't forget Genesis 3. What did God do? God chose a different way to bless and to curse female, male, and uh, the serpent as well. Right. See that? God cursed the woman with something, and it's not popular, but that's what you women got. God cursed the men with something, it's not popular, but that's what you men got. And God blessed as well toward the woman on something, what? The Messiah will come out of it. And that's what, if God did that at Genesis 3, we don't divert that from Genesis 9 either. Why? Because that's God's character we have to understand. God can do whatever He wants. He, this is an individual or a group, whether you call it discriminatory or not, or unfair or not. God does everything for the right purpose, the right reason. He says, this is the individual or group that I curse or bless. This is the individual or group of people that I curse or bless. And then what you do with that cursing and blessing, you can either use it for the glory of God, or you can whine and cry about it and pretend it don't exist. Let me give you a curse that, is, that people are trying to deny. You know what the curse is? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Yep. Well, you can either whine and cry about that, about that curse, and pretend it don't exist, which is what the world is trying to teach yes, you to do, yes, yes. or you can accept what God has cursed you with and say, I can use it for the glory of God. Yes. Uh, there's a brother, uh, means a lot to me. During uh, the time when my church was about to fold, uh, this brother and sister, uh, this couple was the one that kept our church going. Uh, if you look at the wife, she looked white. If you look at the husband, he looked black. But actually the wife, uh, she was white and black. So then uh, he knew about this thing about uh, Ham's curse at Genesis 9, and then he told me this. Yeah, I know about all that kind of stuff, Pastor, but you know what, uh, you know what I've learned? I learned it doesn't matter what position God put me in. I am in no. Uh, I am. Uh, I would not be in a better place than where God put me in. Right, right. That speaks volumes right there. That speaks volumes right there. All right, going back to Genesis nine. Let's uh, wrap this up quickly. Uh, I want to wrap this up quickly. All right. So one of the arguments at Genesis nine twenty five. They would try to concentrate that this is only for Canaan. This is not Ham's seed at verse 25. Now, the thing is this, is that I don't agree with that uh, teaching. The reason why is this. It's because if you look at verse 26 and 27, both of these verses, Canaan is servant of servant to Japheth's seed and Shem's seed. Now, they'll try to say that Canaan fulfilled his role as servant of servants uh, with the Jews at verse 26, right? So that's why they'll limit it only to Canaan. But what are you going to do about Japheth then at verse 27? Not only that, there's no doubt Noah was looking collectively at his son lineage, not just one individual Canaan. He was looking at his son's lineage. You might say, why? Because he did that with Shem at verse 26. He did that with Japheth at verse 27. He didn't pick one of their children. Why in verse 25 then? The question is why in verse 25 he would pick a child right here? The reason why is this. It's because Ham got blessed at verse Genesis chapter 9 verse 8. Genesis 9, 8 and 9. God spake to Noah and his sons. See that? So God specifically put the blessing on Shem, Ham and Japheth and Noah. So because of that, uh, Ham couldn't receive the curse, but his lineage, his seed, could receive the curse after that. So and that's why uh, Noah pronounced it on his son at verse 25. And another thing is this. Another thing is, 
Why I see Ham's seed is tied here, not just Canaan, is because why would the Bible keep saying at verse 18 and 22, all together, Ham the father of Canaan. Ham the father of Canaan. It's showing, it's showing his lineage, his seed right here. I see verse 25 through 27 as more concerning about Ham, Shem, and Japheth's seed and offspring. It's that simple. You might say, why? It's uh, because of 26, 27 context. That's uh, referring to lineage. And then uh, not only that, I, uh, when I look at history, God's cursings and blessings, it doesn't stop at the Mosaic timeline. When God gave the cursing and blessing, this goes on all the way until Jesus comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when I see history, this fits to a T in history, everything about the blessing and curse in 25 through 27, about Ham's seed, Japheth's seed, and Shem's seed. But the problem with all three races, not just one, but all three here, is that they all use it wrongly on God's cursing and blessing. Why? Because it's not about race here, it's human nature. That's human nature's tendency. If God put a curse on you right now, you can use it for the glory of the Lord, or you can use it wrongly. If God put a blessing on you right now, you can use it for the glory of the Lord, or you can use it wrongly. Doesn't make a difference. Everyone has that free choice. That's universal. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching have been a blessing to the hearers, opened our eyes more to the truth of the Scripture and your Word, and to take it what it is, to understand how you operate work, your personality and character, so that we don't repeat the same mistakes as our forefathers. What men learn from history, Father, is that men never learn from history. May we not repeat a pattern in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.